Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Big Game Hunters. I'm Mike. And I'm Tom. Today, we're going to look at Nexus Ops from Fantasy Flight. But first, chit chat. In today's chit chat, we're going to be talking about Kickstarter, an increasingly prominent force in the board game publishing world. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the chit chat. In today's chit chat, we're going to talk a little bit about Kickstarter. So Kickstarter, Tom, has become an increasingly important force in the area of board game publishing. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's a prominent, it's becoming a more prominent force everywhere in terms of indie projects getting published, but it's particularly poignant in board games. I think it lends itself well. Uh, so A.B. West, you know, game designer on Board Game Geek, runs a blog called Kickstarter Analytics, and I would recommend it. And he's done a lot of the legwork for us just in kind of getting an idea of how much Kickstarter, how many games are going through Kickstarter, and how much Kickstarter has grown since last year. Okay. So he started collecting data in July 2012. He posted about some different trends he was seeing on Kickstarter. And now he recently posted in mid-May of 2013, uh, just kind of updating that, those statistics. So I'm just going to go through them a little bit and just give everyone an idea of just how massive Kickstarter is in terms of the board game industry. All right. Give us the breakdown on Kickstarter then. Well, I learned from the best. So uh, in 2012, about 90% of board game products were successfully Kickstarted. 90% of the products that went through Kickstarter met their goal. This number is a little bit potentially skewed because in 2012, AB West was using a little bit different uh, format for his numbers. He was including, uh, he was using the Kickstarter definition of games, which included some RPGs. So there's a potential confound there, but I think the trend will probably hold even without that. In 2013, only 65% of games that have been kickstarted thus far have been successful. And I think that's partly uh, a result of just more games going on the site. Just and There's more competition now, more people are aware of it, more products are going through that channel. In uh, 2012, almost $10 million was raised for board games through Kickstarter, through the various projects. Now this is crazy, in 2013, that number has gone up to 25 million. So it's more than doubled from 2012. And that's even if you take out the RPGs that were initially included right. in the 2012 number. Which is crazy. So it's growing and it's growing fast. Um, in 2012, the top five games in terms of the amount raised on Kickstarter accounted for about 34% of that total. In 2013, that number is not too different. It's about 29% now for the top five games. That's interesting because I think that it really just shows how explosive some of the hits can be. It's kind of... Uh, you know, it's a win-win more scenario on Kickstarter. They kind of, they really do snowball. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once something gets going and starts reaching those insane uh, high-tier stretch goals like mm -hmm. Zombicide, mm -hmm. it just keeps going and, you know, people really jump on board. Uh, per game, the average has been about $68,000. So, like I said, it's definitely skewed by those $2 million level sure. games. And the last uh, kind of interesting fact that I want to share from his blog is that both in 2012 and so far in 2013, it is held true that if you make that 30% mark, if you raise if you raise about 30% of your goal, then you are very likely to make it all the way. The games that have failed usually have not really gotten off the ground. They haven't made much traction. They haven't made that hit that 30% point. That's the trends in Kickstarter are super impressive. I love that so many uh, in, independent publishers are getting the opportunity to get mm -hmm. their games out there. I also love that we are seeing larger companies take advantage of, yep. hey, this is a product we were thinking about, but we're not sure if it's going to get a good response. Yeah. And lo and behold, it does, and they get, get it made. I think those are two really awesome aspects of Kickstarter. But I am reminded of a cautionary tale uh, from not that long ago. Mm -hmm. So when the 3rd uh, uh, edition D&D came out, the open game license created an opportunity mm. for so many uh, independent publishers, third-party publishers, to create content for the world's most popular role-playing game. And there was much rejoicing. <laughs> Until uh, like two years, two and a half years later, when people started to realize that because of the glut of content that was available, so much of that content was just trash. There yeah. was just one or two usable lines in a $10 supplement. There were completely unbalanced supplemental rule books. There were terrible, terribly written adventures. There was just so much crap that came along with the D open D20 license that I am afraid the same thing is going to happen with the popularity of Kickstarter. Right now, we are still in the everybody's happy and much rejoicing <laughs> phase because... 
this is great for the hobby. It's undeniable yeah. that the attention Kickstarter is getting to board gaming is awesome. It's going to remain to be seen yeah. whether or not we get a bunch of bad eggs out of this. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's interesting about the trends is that, like you know, like we said, about thirty percent to thirty-five percent of the games about the, the amount raised are in those top games. Yeah, and for those, I mean, Zombicide, it's fine, but. I think what's really driving a lot of these Kickstarters are the components. People see that you're getting tons of, you know, pewter minis or pre-painted plastic minis for yeah. your dollar, and that entices people. And it really has very little to do with the rules, the gameplay. Mm -hmm. it has more, way more to do with the theme and the look of and, the components. And the, and the bonuses from the stretch goals. And right, and, that, and those stretch goals then, I think, you know, some people are, are treating Kickstarter like a speculation market. Yeah. So, you know, they're like people, I know some people, a friend of mine who got, who Kickstarted Zombicide, because he knew that it was going to be huge. Once it, it had hit some of those stretch goals, he knew, you know, this is crazy for you know my for my dollar. I'm getting an amazing amount of stuff here, and if this is as limited as they're saying it's going to be, yeah. then this is going to be worth some coin on eBay, and it was hmm. uh, several hundred on eBay. And so it be, it really became it's, you kind of watch out for that. Just like you mentioned, you know, maybe a glut of weak games that just look pretty. You also might have to worry about kind of that speculation market, that kind of what, like, almost a uh, comic book boom in the 90s. Uh, think of, you know, with Death of Superman becoming ridiculous, so oh, people yeah. thinking that it's going to be a collector's mm -hmm. item. Because, yeah. So you have that kind of collector's bubble potential, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know some people, even in the industry, have expressed a similar concern to yours. Uh, Colby Dow, designer of Summoner Wars, has, you know, said publicly that he's not in favor of Kickstarter. He thinks that if you have a good product, it should stand on its own. Yeah. And you know, he doesn't have anything against it, but he thinks you should be able to, you should be willing to take the risk if you believe in your, what you're going to put out there. Sure. Kickstarter takes that risk off of, off of the publisher, which is you know usually a good thing, especially for a small publisher. Like you said, it's kind of a, a really nice alternative to the old print and play, mm -hmm. which you mentioned the bigger publishers. Mm -hmm. That's kind of replaced that, which is nice. But on the other hand, maybe that risk has kept the quality level higher. The, the risk is important, I think. Um, we use the term barrier of entry all the time in gaming, and mm -hmm. it, but it's a term we get from economics, uh, and one of the barriers of entry for small companies, small independent companies, is you have to get past that. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to prove that your game is worthwhile. You have to convince a publisher to invest in it. Kickstarter has removed that, and that's where the concern for quality is coming from. Will we see a drop in quality in general in board games because of this? Mm -hmm. Another concern that uh, I, I think I might agree with. Uh, we read it on a, I read it on a blog that you turned me on to. I can't remember the name of it for the last Black time. Diamond Games? Yes, that's yeah. the one. Um, basically, his long story short, his argument is that Kickstarter is a hindrance to brick-and-mortar game stores. Ah, yes. Uh, he, this blogger, uh, I don't know. Who, who owns a brick-and-mortar game yeah, store on the owns, West Coast, right? He uh, owns a brick-and-mortar game store. He invested in several Kickstarters. And then did not see any return on that investment in his game store. That that game did not sell out of his store mm -hmm. because what made that game appealing were the things associated with Kickstarter, the, the yep. spectator sportness of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that speculator's market, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I had not thought about that before. I hadn't read that entry, but I guess the idea that you know when you're getting a game just into your store, you're not getting all those nice extras. You're yep. just getting the game. And what comes in the box isn't what's turning people on to it. Right. Um, do you think those kind of, that collectible nature of it that we talked before about games as collectibles. Yeah. Game, uh, do you think that Kickstarter, that the idea of increasing the emphasis on those upfront rewards is, you know, maybe too much? That kind of the promos are driving the game more than the gameplay? That is another aspect of the concern about the drop in quality. Mm -hmm. if, if that is what is truly driving all these successful games... The, the only end result that I can foresee is that so many of these very popular games, which are demanding a high price in the secondary market, are just not worth it as yeah. games. Sure, sure. Now, what about, uh, you know, I think we might want to talk about uh, talk a little bit about Kickstarter in other realms. So here at the show, we'd really like to continue doing what we're doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in the future... We've talked about potentially putting together a Kickstarter of our own in order to raise funds to up the production value and keep doing what we love doing here. Do you think there's any risk in Kickstarter being bad for things like that, for shows like ours? Well, I don't see that... Uh, patronage in the arch has always been a tradition. It mm -hmm. maybe went away for a little while, but it's been around for 400 years. 
it's this is the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, because like with a video Kickstarter, you're showing in your Kickstarter, you're showing what you're going to give. Yes, there's going to be some speculation aspect of it, but there's no material that's mm -hmm. left behind other than the show that you're getting in return. Yeah. So th this really is just a modern form of, of patronage of the arts. Uh, we're only able to reach out to a mass of people for patronage rather than just yeah. one rich lord or priest. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Very well said. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think that basically sums up our thoughts on Kickstarter. Uh, I do think that it's a very positive force in the industry right now. I hope that we, you know, Turn and Tom and other people turn out to be wrong and that it doesn't lower the quality. We'll see. But yeah, for now, we're going to take a look at a non Kickstarter game, but a game I'm happy to see reprinted Nexus Ops. Now I'm going to teach you how to play Nexus Ops. Nexus Ops is a streamlined sci fi conquest game where players are vying for control over territory. The game ends as soon as one player reaches 12 victory points with that player winning the game, or as soon as any player is eliminated. A player is eliminated when that player has no more units on the board and no way to get more units on the board. At that point, the player with the most victory points among the remaining players wins the game. Nexus Ops comes with a number of vibrant components. Each player will receive an identical army composed of six different unit types. In addition, each player will get a battle card going over the units in a little more detail. At the top, you'll see the names of all the units, and below that, claw icons denoting whether or not the unit can mine rubium. If the unit has a claw icon, it can. Below that, you'll see the cost and rubium of each unit in orange, and next to that in blue, you'll see the number that the unit has to roll to hit in combat. For instance, a human has to roll a six or better when rolling to attack. And below that, each unit has some sort of special qualities. And at the bottom, you'll see a nice phase overview as a reminder for each player. In addition, the game comes with a number of energized cards. These cards come in two main flavors, deployment cards, which must be played during the deployment phase, and battle cards, which of course will influence combats. The game has a number of hexes that can be interchanged to form the main battle map and exploration tokens that are placed on the hexes and either reveal rubium mines or rock striders. These mines can be mined for rubium ore during that phase, and the striders, when revealed, will immediately go into that player's reserve uh, and be deployed for that player. In addition, the game has a number of secret mission cards. Again, these come in two flavors, uh, the non-combat and the combat objectives. And a number of identical battle victory cards, which are essentially used to just track basic VP. Finally, the game has rubium chips in fives and ones, and dice to resolve combats. To set up a game of Nexus Ops, first randomly determine the starting player and give each player a different color of army. Then, shuffle the Energize deck and the Secret Mission deck and place them to the side of the board. Now you're ready to build the map. Place the monolith tile in the center and the six single hex tiles in a circle around it. Then take the double hex tiles and place them in a circle around that. Finally, take the four player bases and set them in the four corners. Note that this is a setup for a four player game and setting it up for a different number of players will have the map looking a little different. Then you'll place the exploration tokens all face down on every tile except the monolith and the player base tiles. Finally, you'll receive starting rubium. The player who will start the game receives 8 rubium, and each subsequent player receives an additional 3. So the first player will receive 8, the second player will get 11, the third 14, and the final player will get 17 starting rubium. Once you've received your initial resources, you're ready to begin the game. Nexus Ops is played out in turns, and each turn is broken down into six phases. The first phase of the turn is deployment. In this phase, you'll spend rubium that you've acquired previously in order to purchase new units, and you'll place them in any of your three starting zones. Each unit costs an amount depicted on your battle chart. For instance, humans cost two rubium each. You are limited by the units in your stock, but when units are destroyed, they go back into your stock to be repurchased. Then, you'll move into the movement phase. In the movement phase, you can move each of your units one hex each. 
Some units, such as the Rock Strider and Lava Leaper, can move additional spaces with their special abilities. You cannot move a unit either from a contested hex into another contested hex or from a contested hex into another hex controlled by your opponent. In other words, you can't move from one battle into another battle during this phase. Then you'll conduct exploration. In the exploration phase, you will flip over any still unrevealed exploration tokens that are in spaces with your units. This means that as you first start to explore the map, you'll find lots of stuff. After that, you won't be exploring for very long. When you flip over a token, you'll see either a rock strider, a double mine, or a mine with another unit. If you flip a rock strider, you'll simply discard the token and take a rock strider from your supply and place it in that space. If you have a mine and a unit, such as a fungoid or a crystalline creature, you will place one of those units in the appropriate space, just like the rock strider, and in future turns, or even in this turn, you'll be able to mine that single mine as long as you have appropriate tr troops on it. The same holds true for the double mine, it just gives you more rubium when you do mine it. After that, you'll enter the battle phase. In the battle phase, you'll conduct one battle in each contested hex. A contested hex is a hex containing troops from more than one uh, player. When you conduct battle, you will do so in battle order. It's important to note that a battle does not continue until all troops are destroyed necessarily. Each type of troop, or each troop actually, will attack one time and then the battle will end. This means that a battle can end with a hex still being contested. The units will attack in battle order from right to left. So a Rubium Dragon will attack and then a Lava Leaper and so on and so forth. If both players have units of the same type, they'll attack simultaneously. So for instance, if I have a Rubium Dragon and the same hex as an opponent's Rubium Dragon, we'll each roll their attacks at the same time and resolve casualties one at a time. When you resolve casualties, the player who is receiving the damage will choose one unit from the battle to be destroyed. If this unit has not yet attacked, then the unit will not have an opportunity to do so. Of course, the units only hit on the rolls shown on the chart. After battle, if the player who was the aggressor, in other words, the player whose active turn it was, eliminated all enemy units from that hex, then he has won the battle. If there were multiple enemies in the same hex, for instance, if I have units in the same hex as both the blue and the yellow player, and I'm playing red, then I choose to conduct battle with only one of the two players and ignore the other player. If I wipe out only the player of the color that I'm battling with, I'm considered to have won the battle as the aggressor. If you win the battle as the aggressor, you automatically receive one battle victory card, which is one victory point towards completing your goal, and you can play up to one secret mission card, assuming you've met the requirements from your hand. If you win a battle as the defender, then you do not get to draw these cards. That means if you're a defender and wipe out opposing attackers, you won't get the points. However, the defender who is wiped out instead may draw one Energize card as a reward. Next up is the mining phase. After you've conducted all battles, all of your units with the claw icon, that's the first three, can mine rubium from the mines they're standing on. It doesn't matter how many units of this type you have on an individual mine, it will only produce the number in the triangle. After mining rubium, you will go on to the draw phase. In the draw phase, you will simply draw one secret mission card and place it in your hand. And if you happen to have a unit on the monolith, that's the center space, you'll draw two energized cards. You only get these energized cards if you were on the obelisk, or monolith, sorry, and it is uncontested. Now you know how to play Nexus Ops. So now that you know how to play Nexus Ops, we're going to take a look at it in our point-counterpoint review. Because Mike and I agree about the game, I'm going to roll to see who will argue for it and who will argue against. If it's even, I'll take the pros, and if it's odd, he will. It's odd. Back to form. So, uh, you know, Tom last week, he decided maybe he'd give games a chance. Give Love a chance, Tom. But, you know, he found it wasn't for him. No, so I'm, I'm going to tell you what a great, beautiful game Nexus Ops is. And Tom... I'm going to tell you how it's just lame. It's a lame, lame game. So to begin with, Tom, 
Nexus Ops, we talked in a previous episode about elegant design. We have. Nexus Ops is really the platonic form of elegant design. <laughs> there is nothing, all games aspire to be Nexus Ops in their elegance. Wow. Let me just start off by saying that we're talking about balance on three levels here, Tom. Wow. To begin with, the cards, the energized cards, very well balanced. I feel like every time I get an energized card, I'm happy to see it. I feel like there's, there are none that are just throwaways. Uh, they all feel like they're appropriate. They might be situational. You know, they have a little flavor. Mm -hmm. But I feel like they are all pretty much equally useful. Uh, that's really nice in a game like this. Often we'll see cards that we have to house rule out. Like Seasons, you're going to love it, but about six of those cards had to go. Um, with this one, the cards are just really nicely balanced. In addition, the units are very balanced. I always feel like I'm compelled at some point in the game or another to buy one of everything that's on this chart. Uh, I know there's only six, so you know it's not a huge achievement to have balanced them so well, but really the, there are six, but uh, really they're, the unit types just give me a feeling like uh, they're, they just feel like they're all well-costed. None of them feel really overpriced or underpriced. Yep. None of them feel like you're gonna absolutely dominate if you buy this, but get crushed if you buy that. What I like is that you can buy a lot of the small units and you really kind of need to in order to back up those big ones. Mm -hmm. If you're not gonna really rely on some lucky die rolls, you need to pair the, you know, the mining troops, the small guys, with the bigger ones as a kind of shield. So I just really like the way the units are set up in terms of their balance. And finally, the exploration tiles. This one has been a little more controversial, I think, but the exploration tiles, I think, are really well balanced as well. There are only three types, so you can either a rock strider, a double mine, or a single mine with one of the two middle units, either mm -hmm. a fungoid or a crystalline. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you get, you have some edge. You have some poignant advantage over your opponents at that phase of the game. If you get several double mines near your base, well, that's great. You're, you're set up for a nice long game. You're in it for the long haul. You're just gonna try to hold up, turtle, build up your resources, and over time, overtake your opponent with superior rubium. But on the flip side, if you get uh, several rock striders in your home, you're gonna need to move out. That, may, that put it's a natural pacing on the game. It means that players can't all just sit back and not engage each other. Mm -hmm. They need to get in each other's faces. The rock strider players will have to advance and bring the fight to the players with the double mines, take that territory, take mines away from them. Just really well balanced all around. It's worth noting that at least in this version of the game, there are additional tiles, like advanced tiles, I think they call them, yes. that you could use. But those tiles do seem to sort of change the balance in the tiles. There's some that are like just a rumbium bonus and then everything goes away. Mm -hmm. There isn't that elegance of design and balance of the tiles. With they're not the bad, but they're it, not as clean. It's I not mean. a real con against the game, yeah. but you might find your gameplay changes if you include them. So do you even have a real con, Tom? I do. I do. <clears throat> Much like your humor earlier this episode, this game can be a little dry. Yeah? Yeah. What I mean by that is, uh, okay, you look at it, and any player is going to think, oh, wow, this is, this is a mirror trash game. This is my kind of game. It's got dice. It's got cards. It's got miniatures. I'm in. Speak my language. Right. And then you start to get into it, and you're, like, waiting for that wow card to come out. Like, what, where's the card that makes me win? Or how come I'm rolling all these sixes, but he's just surviving? Like, I'm really out rolling him here, but I'm not winning. What's going on? When you start to look deeper at the game, like you said, it is really elegantly balanced, and I feel like there are a lot of uh, Euro elements in this Ameritrash game. That can really be a turnoff for some people who are looking at this like, where, where is the swinginess? Where, where's my luck coming in? Stuff like that. Uh, the, the elegant balance of it, definitely a pro, but it's so balanced that it just might make the gameplay a little uninteresting. Yeah, I can kind of see that. It can get a little dry. I think that's especially poignant with the Energized cards. They are they don't vary too, too much. They don't do anything particularly evocative. You don't have with this one those oh wow moments that you sometimes get with something like Star Trek Fleet Captains. Yeah. That where you get a, you know, a triples and all of a sudden you're like, yes, that yeah. is, those are triples. Captain Kirk. Right. Um, but with this one, you know, I can look past that because unlike other war games that are more swingy, that, you know, do have some kind of that have more flavor, but add in them crazy dice rolls and crazy, you know, turns of the of the the game because of just luck. Yeah. This one, it has dice, and I usually, you know, would would be a little avoidant of it, but it mitigates the dice element so well 
in how the units are set up. So as I mentioned earlier, when you have those big costly units, when you throw that Rubium Dragon around, you're going to want to have some bodyguards for him. You're going to want to put some humans or fungoids with him mm -hmm. so that they can take the hits. The fact that you go, that the battle order goes right to left and that you choose the casualty, the player who's receiving the hits chooses the casualties, means that in this one, even if your opponent has some big hits, you hopefully have set up your, your squad or your army in such a way that you can overcome those. So those hits aren't going to wipe out your main attack sure. force. They're going to chip away at your you know, front line infantry. Yes, I do like uh, how the dice, the randomness of the dice are mitigated in this game, similar to how we saw in Galaxy Trucker, where mm -hmm. uh, the randomness of that dice, of that mechanic is distributed across a bell curve, so the center of the ship gets hit more often, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it's dice used well, that's what we like. Um, the part about combat that I don't like mm. is uh, the early game. So imagine this scenario, if you will. You're exploring your tiles, you turn, you've got all your tiles in your area turned over, and it turns out you get three rock striders and no mines, none. So you gotta be aggressive. So your strategy is clearly, uh, you need to be aggressive, you need to take some mines, but it's early game. You don't have the human slash clone resources you need to keep those rock striders alive through bad die rolls. So the, the randomness of the, of the dice in that situation are not mitigated, and it's a scenario, it's not a super likely scenario, but it has happened to someone at this table who isn't Mike. Uh, He's so still a little it, better. So, so it can happen. Uh, and, you know, the, yes, the combat dice are elegant, but the early game, not so much. Well, your old wounds being said, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I do agree with the early game, you can get screwed. That's kind of the place where this game's a little vulnerable when you haven't quite get set up, gotten set up yet, and you have a drastically different setup than sure. your opponent in that way. I'll give you that one, Tom. But, uh, you know, continuing with the idea of this game being incredibly elegant, the energy cards, the energized cards, excuse me, uh, they just work so well for so many reasons. First of all, they're a healthy rubber band mechanic. They're a rubber band mechanic that really works well in terms of keeping people who are kind of on the defensive in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and they kind of add a little bit of back and forth. The energized cards really kind of spice up the game. And so it's good to have a natural way to work them in without just a simple you get one a turn kind mm -hmm. of mechanic. Mm -hmm. So I like that. In addition, getting them for holding the monolith seems like a very kind of commensurate reward. It feels like, you know, when you, at the end of the turn, if you're holding the monolith uncontested, you get two energized cards. It feels like that's a legitimate reason. That's just a compelling enough reason to go for the monolith without having to make an all out sprint. Yeah. It's not such a big reward that the player who controls the monolith will actually absolutely dominate everybody else, but it's enough to, you know, keep them going and to, you know, kind of, because they're on the hill, they're gonna be a target. And so the idea that the energized cards kind of bolster them when they're up there really works well for me. And finally, uh, the idea that you can sell the energized cards for Rubium. You can sell the energized cards and the secret mission cards for one Rubium apiece anytime during your turn. That works really well too, because even though, like we said, the cards are pretty well balanced, and that goes for the, both the energized and the secret mission cards, they're not perfect. And the ability to turn any of them into one you know, chip apiece, one Rubium apiece, not only does that help to iron out any kind of imperfections in the cards to kind of uh, you know balance them even more, but that also serves to create decision points. It's something we talked about in a previous chit chat. And so the idea that these can all either be played for their effect or be used as resources to further your army just means that every time, every turn, you're going to have to make that decision. That's another you know path you can take in your series of decisions you're making for this game. Yep. Which is just all plays into why this game has such a high skill value. It is such a beautiful design. It is. It, it really is quite an elegant design to use your word for it. I really struggled coming up with the last con for this one. But if you're familiar at all with the original production of this game. I am quite familiar with you it. You can see some disappointment in the current release. Uh, first of all, the monolith in the center, it's just another tile. It used to be a nice cardboard standee. Mm -hmm. You could put troops on top of it. It was fun. It's not. It's missing. Also, there's just something disappointing about the miniatures. Like their assembly now, you can get some arms missing on some of your guys. The, yeah, where do we go? There's, we do have a rock guy with it. Up oh, here he is. Uh, uh, these Thor. guys. What are these called? Lava leapers. They uh, they don't stand up too well. They got little feet that fold. This one. Okay. I'll, I'll, there you go. I thought he was gonna make me a liar. 
they, their feet fold. Just the miniature quality on this print run, this production run, is a little bit less than what it was with the other ones. The the uh, they different colors. They were brighter colors. They glowed under black light. Mm -hmm. It just felt like a, a fuller game in the box than this one does. Yeah, uh, you know, I actually ended up picking up a copy of the original print about three to six months before this one came out from Fantasy Flight. And at first I was annoyed when they announced the reprint. Yeah. Uh, it was three to six months before the announcement. And I, you know, told my friend Ryan, I was like, I can't believe, I just picked this up for, you know, a decent money, amount of money on eBay. I can't believe they're reprinting it now. I'm so mad. But then when I actually saw it, I was kind of happy that I did have the original because I haven't picked up this version. It, there's just something a little grittier about it. There's something, like the figures are a little more detailed, but they just don't look as appealing. I can't quite put my finger on it. But I, yeah, I definitely agree that the reprint was a little, it's not bad, it's not bad, but it's disappointing after seeing a the, little bit. the uniqueness of the original. Yep. So how do you give you this game the final rating? So yeah, this one, it really works for me. This It's very original in that it's not really in reinventing the wheel, but it's taking the elements of you know StarCraft or Warcraft, uh, and it's you know stripping them down to their bare components. Mm -hmm. It's you know, just the bare essentials of that kind of explore, gather resources, conquer your opponent game. Yeah. And you know I usually play this one two v two. That's kind of my preferred way to play it. So you get that kind of interaction with your teammate where you're discussing strategy. You're figuring out constantly. You know what do I sell for Rubium? Who do I go after? You know which front. You're it's. Kind of like, uh, it's almost like if Reiner Keynes had designed a combat game. Sure. Because you're constantly making that kind of decision. You can't do it all, and you constantly have to say, well, what do I give up? You know, what am I going to focus on? What am I going to have to, what can I most afford to lose on this one? And I love that kind of decision making. I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10 because it's a really beautifully elegant combat game. I feel like I can teach it easily, play it with anybody. Big hit. The teaching element is a, a big hit for me too. I really do like the the Ameri trashy nature of it, uh, but for my personal group, uh, it's going to be one of those games where, uh, when when we have evolved to the stage where we're starting to look at the Euro style games as more interesting, this will be the one that I'll bring out. Mm, like so, as a gateway from a Ameri trashy, right, sure, right, yeah. Because of that, sure. Really, the really balanced elements of. of Basically, managing all your resources, and I include combat in that. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's fun. It's a really fun game. I'm gonna give it a seven out of ten. Okay. Good stuff. All right, get ready for the breakdown of uh, what's the Nexus name? Ops. There you go. This is the breakdown of Nexus Ops from Fantasy Flight. Your game time will vary with the number of players, but our games average between 90 and 120 minutes, so we give it 30 short and 70 long. Nexus Ops plays quickly for a game with alternating turns, so we give it 80 fast and 20 slow. The many random elements in the game are mitigated by the mechanics of the game. The skill it takes to win surrounds managing your resources and using your troops wisely, so we give it 25 luck and 75 skill. We have a 50-50 split on strategy and tactics, because the tiles you win and defend each turn all build upon your previous turns to win you the game. We give it 90 interaction because it's a direct conflict zero-sum war game. Only the opening turns aren't all that interactive, so we give it 10 independence. We give it 70 immersion and 30 abstraction because the mechanics of the game do serve the combat and resource management theme, but many of the cards don't. We give it 80 simplicity because it is easy to learn and teach. Adapting to the dice combat that's mitigated by troop resources and combat where winning has different results whether you're the aggressor or the defender is enough to give it 20 complexity. For portability and grandeur, we give it a 50-50 split, average size box, average size game. We give it 20 expandability, there's an expansion right inside the box that you can use, and you could always uh, want to add more cards but you don't really need to, so we give it 80 completeness. For our trophy scales, we give it four trophies and originality. It's a really well-balanced war game that is sort of a blend between Ameritrash and Euro styles. For value, we give it three trophies. It's got a moderate price, but the components are really great. Mike gives it an eight out of 10, Tom gives it a seven out of 10, and that is the breakdown of Nexus Ops. We hope you gathered lots of rubium in Nexus Ops. Next week in the Chit Chat, we're gonna be talking about perceived balance versus actual balance and play testing. And we're going to be taking a look at Wits and Wagers, the fun trivia party game. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for regular updates. 
See the links below for our Facebook and Twitter pages, and leave us your comments on Kickstarter and how it's affecting the industry. See you next week. Drive, maybe can vote, can't drink. <laughs>